Praise the Lord. Welcome to Victorious Living Show. I'm your host, Prince Paul. And I'm delighted, delighted that you are learning this with us, that together we can be able to take that which the Lord has laid hold of us. And we are talking about faith, and we say that faith is that assurance. You, uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 1 defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You, have, you are assured of that thing, though you are just hoping for it. And you are actually the amplified version. If you look at the amplified classic, it adds some words that to me I look at uh, is very powerful. And that's why I would want to read that portion of scripture. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, the New King James says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you read it that way, it may not have so many details, but the Amplified keeps it this way. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. You know, when you have a title deed, if someone comes and says, this is the Lord I'm giving to you, this here is a title deed, now you are sure there's Lord. You may have to do some process of searching out the title to confirm. It is the original in the uh, government records. But when you see the title deed, that gives you an assurance that you will not have over someone who just tells you that I have some Lord somewhere that you can take. So it is, it is the title deed of things hoped for. It is the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. You are convicted that what you don't see, but it said in the word, is the reality. And again, if you wait to see it, it is no longer faith. Because faith has an aspect of hope in it. You hoped for that thing. You trusted to get it. You had that expectations that you are going to receive that thing because the word says so. It is ends by saying that faith perceiving as fact what is not revealed to the senses. Faith perceiving as fact what is not revealed to the senses. Now, your faith brings a reality to what you cannot see with your eyes, to what you cannot feel, to what you cannot touch. But because you have faith for it, it as it is in the word, you get to see it. A good example is uh, Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 1. Elisha says to this servant of the king that tomorrow at a time like this, the bill of wheat will be sold for one shekel. And as I said in a past session, the situations were bad at that moment. But because Elisha had the word of God, he did not care to know how these things are going to be done. He knew that God will fulfill his word. So God now used the four rapers and the Syrians' friend. And these things are of God. The first point is for us to believe them. That's why we read in John 14 and verse 10 that Jesus says that the words that I speak, I do not speak of my own authority. So do not just speak things. Speak what is in the word. Speak according to his will. If you look at that scripture and the one we, just, we just read, First John chapter five and verse fourteen and fifteen, you read that these things marry together. They all agree that I believe it from the word. I speak it because I believe it, and God does the works. Jesus does the works, and when you speak in faith, when you speak with the assurance, God brings it to pass. Now. What are these things that we need to know? What are these things that we need to be assured of so that we can speak them out? The first thing is righteousness. Because if you go back to Ephesians 6, and from verse 10 onwards, it talks about the spiritual warfare, and it says that we don't let so against flesh and blood. We are fighting against forces of darkness. 
And there is something we need to be assured about, that we are righteous. Because it says, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Because if you don't have the assurance of your righteousness, you don't have the confidence. And if you don't have the confidence, you don't have the knowing. If you don't have the knowing, you don't have your petitions. So it goes back to what do you know that you have? So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible tells us that for he made him who knew no sin to be seen for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So any time that you are dealing with a situation, stop first of all checking yourself. Have I done good things enough? Have I done well enough to qualify for God to bless me? No. If you look at it that way, you will never qualify. You will never do enough because the righteousness of God is too high for any of us to attain. I keep giving the example, if we have to jump at a distance of 100 feet upwards and someone jumps two feet high and another one jumps 50 feet and another one jumps 70 feet, all of us have fell. We have not gotten to the jump, the high, the level that you are to jump over. We were supposed to jump 100 feet. You jumped 70. So you are still 30 feet away. You missed. So if it, we were going over the sea, even if you jump 99 feet, you still fall. You don't get over the other side. And the righteousness of God is to that level. It says that if you fail in the book of James, it says that the law of God is perfect. If you miss in one, you have missed in all. So if the distance you are jumping over is hard feet and you jump 99, you still fall in the water. You don't get to move to the other side. And this is how God has kept his perfection. It is too high that you never attain it on your own. So does that mean you never receive anything from God? No. To the, the best news is because you cannot attain it on your own as you trust God, as you put your faith and your confidence in what Christ has done, then you receive the righteousness of God based on what Jesus did for you. So it is no longer about you. It is no longer about your works. It is no longer about do I qualify? It is no longer about do I do the best? I, have I done what I to the highest expectation. No, the poor question is, do, do I believe in what Christ has done for me? Do I believe that I am the righteousness of God? Because when you're the righteousness of God, it means you're not your own righteousness. So even when you fall short, you still start knowing that I'm not depending on me, I'm depending on him, and at all times, he is perfect. Praise the Lord. So for faith to work, the first thing that has to be assured on the inside of you is that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It is not by works. Your works will never qualify you to receive from the Lord. And when you are assured of the righteousness, there's another thing that, that I think I should actually have started with it all, all the same. But it is very important to understand is that your relationship with the Father. Who are you in the sight of God? In Luke chapter 11, the scriptures talk about asking and receiving. And if you look at from verse 11 of, this, uh, of Luke 11, this is what the Bible says. Let me start from verse 9. Luke 11, 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and you seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Here, the Lord is saying, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, that will be opened to you. Now, Unfortunately, most of us think that when I ask, will he really do it? When he himself says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, you'll find, knock, that will be opened. That's what he says he'll do. And he says, everyone, 
<laughs> That's a very big statement. Everyone who asks receives. And you may be saying, that's not true. I asked and I did not receive. Well, I'll tell you more about that later. It says, everyone who seeks finds. Everybody who knocks, the door is opened. Now, Jesus, for him to qualify that statement, he went on ahead to use the example of father and son. He says, if, Luke 11, 11, if a son asks for bread from the father among you, Will he give him a stone? Or if he has asked for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? So Jesus is using the example of a father and a son here. And he's saying as a father, if your son asks for bread, can you give them a stone? You know, as parents, when you have a young child, if you see them touching sandals to risk it to their lives, you actually take it away very fast. But you always ensure they are fed. You always ensure they have the best thing that you can, that is in your capacity to give it to them. Because you love them. You want the best for this child as a parent. Now, he says, in verse 12, or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? So, Luke 11, 13, this is what it says. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So if, in, remember in your personality, in your own, you don't have any good thing. Your goodness is in Christ in you. It is him who made you good. So if you do not have all this, and you love to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father? One thing that Jesus tried to establish so much is that God is a father. The moment you look to God as a father and you stop looking at him as a distant God, this God who requires righteousness, perfection, and I cannot attain it. And when you stop looking at him in that level and you start seeing him as your father, then there's a special relationship that comes in. And a father does not fail their son as much as they are able to do it. And what we know about, we know about our God, that he owns everything. He has everything. All that we need is available. You know, at some point I was thinking, if God is the one who made the heavens and the earth, and all that is in it, he made the whole earth, with the trees, with the fruits, with the good things, and then placed one man on the earth and tells this one man, multiply and fill the earth. Look at how extravagant God is. He makes millions of miles of land and then puts one man there to feed it. He has all access to all fruits, all the goods that grow from the ground. He has all access to everything. That's how God provides for his people. The supply from God is always far greater than the demand. Do you know the sun can feed more than a thousand of this earth? I don't remember the exact number, but it can feed more than a thousand of these earths. And if you read from the scriptures, you see the sun was made to give light to the earth. Now, God makes something so big to give light to something so small. And specifically, it is for this earth. Not, nothing else. There was no other reason for the sun to be made. All the stars, all these other things. It was because of this earth, because we are here. That's how much extravagant God is. He is willing to give us far beyond Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to that power that works in us. He is able to do far more than you can ever ask, than you can ever think. And guess what? He is not just waiting to do. He has already placed the power in you. It is according to that power that works in us. This is our father. Do you have the mindset that God is a father to you? Do you see him as a lovely, 
daddy to you? Does he, he look good to your sight? Or you look at him and you're afraid of him? Do you see him and you're afraid that he is going to punish you? Is that what you think of God every time? Oh, I don't want to be careful to sin, lest you are punished by God. Be careful for this error, lest God, this is a calamity to us. If that's what you think, the devil will take advantage and you bring calamities in your life because you are expecting them. So stop looking at God as this distanced, distant king, distant God, distanced creator. See him as your father who actually dwells in you through the Holy Spirit. He is so close to you, so close to you, that he can never get any closer. He loves you so much that his love for you can never be qualified by anything that is on this earth. And the moment you understand that, remember Ephesians chapter 3 again. Before you get to verse 20, where it talks about he is able to do the upper verses from verse 17. He talks about the love of God. He says that this love, you cannot able to explain the height, the length, the width, the depth. It is unknowable when it comes to just information. It requires a revelation because it is too great. This love that God has for us, it is too great that he had to send his only begotten son not to lose you. That's how variable you are before God. And if that can become a revelation to you, then everything else you are asking for, and I'm going to come to that very soon, everything else you are asking for becomes just truly true. The one day, what then do we say? Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says this, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, to those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to to the spirit. There is now no condemnation to you. Jesus has done it for you. You are the righteous one of God. Your father loves you and he is not looking to condemn you. He is not looking to judge you. He is not looking to release bad judgment towards you. He is, his plan towards you is for good and not for evil. To prosper you and not fail you. To give you a hope and a future. Is that the confidence that you have today? Is that the assurance that you have today? This is amazing love. It is amazing love. And because of that, I want to go to that Romans 8. And we see a few verses from that chapter because it really helps if you are able to understand what has already been accomplished on your behalf. And this chapter is loaded with sweet, sweet, sweet things that God has done for us. He actually even says in verse 26 that the Holy Spirit groans for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. He actually prays for us, through us. <laughs> this is so good to even, to even avoid reading. That likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. God loves you so much that even when he knows you will not be able to pray for what exact thing that he wants you to pray for because he wants to bless you so much, he wants to bless you so extravagantly, and you may limit yourself. He gives you the Holy Spirit who can pray through you, who can pray in you with glories that cannot be uttered, and God releases this good, beautiful and wonderful blessings in your life because he loves you. And now, thinking about that, such God, that's where we go to let me, be, let me even go down to verse 27 or downwards. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the might of the Spirit is, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So he prays for us according to his will. He does not just pray, but it is in line to what the Lord desires of us. But again, don't miss the fact that he does this through us in us and by us. The Holy Spirit will not force himself, force you to pray. He will come and move you to pray, but you have to choose to agree with him and make the prayer. 
So he says, he maketh intercession according to the will of God. Now, this is where the popular verse comes in, Romans 8.28, and we know, uh, anytime you see add, that connects the upper verse and the lower one. So because he makes intercession for us with glories that cannot be uttered, and we know. Again, this we know comes in here. What do you know about him? He says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. You know, as long as you love God, as long as you are in his purpose, as long as you are not being controlled by your own desires, by the fresh desires, everything in your life works for good. Because when you are spirit-led, he prays for you. He prays through you. He prays according to his will, according to the will of the Father. And because he does pray according to the will of the Father, then you can receive from him. So, in verse 29 it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So whom he foreknew, notice something here, he also predestined. Now, as long as you have chosen to give your life to be led by the Spirit of God, everything that happens to you had been foreplanned. David says in Psalm 139, you saw my days before any of them was, and my days were written in your book. That word, my days were written in your book, may suggest that each day of my life was written in your book. God knew every day, every single day of our lives before any of them ever was. How awesome this God is. How great he is. And based on his foreknowledge, he predestined us. What does that foreknowledge mean? That God knew how you would behave. God knew whether you would agree with him. He knew whether you would believe in him. He knew whether you would pray. He knew all these things. And because of that, he has already predestined you for victory. For greatness. To be conformed to the pattern of his son. And verse 30 says, Moreover, who he predestined, this he also called. And them that he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Hold on, awesome verse. That because of his foreknowledge, he prepared things for you. And then called you and justified you. Justified means like just as if you never sinned. You are perfect in his sight through Jesus. And because of that, he has already glorified you. That goes beyond any human thinking. That God has glorified you even before you have qualified. Because you never qualify by yourself, God has already glorified you. How does he glorify? Based on his foreknowledge. So that you don't think that there are some people that God loves and others he doesn't love. No. God loves us all. He died for us all. He all the sins of the world has been paid for, but we have to receive that which has been done. And I like the, the following verses. So what then shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? And I want you to go through this day asking yourself that question. That if God is for you, who can be against you? Know that many will not try to be against you. This, act, this word should, can actually read, who can be successfully against us. They can't try to be against you, but they cannot win. They will never win against you. Remember what Jesus said about the church in Mark, Matthew 16 and verse 18? That I said to you, Peter, you are the rock, and upon this uh, rock, where Jesus is the chief cornerstone, where he is the solid rock upon which we stand, upon that rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That does not mean that they don't try. They try every time to attack the church, to join the church, to do everything against the church, but they cannot prevail. 
So if God is for you, and for sure he is, he is for you, he is on your side, who can be against you? And verse that to say something very special here. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God gave the best that he had, the best that he had, his only begotten son, what else is too big for God to give to you? I want you to think about that so critically today. If God gave his, think about it, his son, not his wealth, his only begotten son, if he gave him for you, what is that that you are asking from him today that is too big that he cannot give it to you? God loves you. There is nothing in this world that he is willing to withhold from you. Nothing at all. And all oh, that you may be assured of that. All oh, that this may become a revelation to you. All oh, that you may meditate on this creature today. Instead of worrying over what you don't have. St start confessing this scripture. If he gave his son for me, well, how shall he not with him freely give you all things that you ever ask for? All things that you ever need. Is that peace that you need? Too big for him. He already gave it to you. Is that joy that you need to be for him? He already gave it to you. Is that rent that you're asking for too big for him? He has already provided everything. Is food too great for him to withhold from you? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things shall be added to you. Today, God believing that if he gave his only son, there's nothing that he cannot give me. If he gave his son for me, there is nothing in this world that he can withhold from me. And if you can believe that, I can assure you, your faith will rise and you'll be able to receive everything that you need from your father. Jesus loves you. God loves you. Believe it today. Confess it today. Start on it today. And you see it happening in your life. I'm your host, Prince Paul. This is Victoria's Living Show. May the goodness of God continue manifesting in your life. Today, God be living. He gave his son for me. Everything else I need is available for me. God bless you.